The success or failure of something is determined by laws, and therefore laws make life predictable. Success is a result of obedience to those laws. The success of a product protects the reputation of the manufacturer. Did you know your success is good for God? Your success has nothing to do with other people. Success is fulfilling and completing your purpose in life. The first command God gave man was to work. Work is a law. That means anything that stops you from working violates a law. When God told Adam, work, he was telling Adam to become what's trapped on the inside. Work is like a seed becoming a tree. Work is becoming what you were designed to be and do. There are keys in life, and I live by them. And so tonight, I'm going to give you the master key to unlock your personal success and prosperity. Everybody wants to succeed. Nobody wants to fail in life. The man sleeping under the bridge and the man sleeping in a castle both want to be successful. And I also want to emphasize that success is predictable. So is failure. You can predict failure and success, and there's a reason why. Everything in life was designed and created to function by laws. The success or failure of something is determined by laws. And therefore, laws make life predictable. Laws make life simple. That means God designed everything in life to function by laws. Therefore, he designed everything to be successful. Success is not something you pursue. Success is a result of obedience to those laws. Did you know your success is good for God? Why is your success good for God? Because of a principle of manufacturing. And that is, the success of a product protects the reputation of the manufacturer. Whenever a product fails, that affects the reputation or the name of its manufacturer. Now pay attention. I'm going to give you powerful principles that if you learn them and follow what I'm teaching, you will be successful. Success is not something you try to achieve. That's why most people are not successful. They are trying to succeed. Successful people in history never tried to be successful. They simply focused on pursuing a purpose and then obeying some laws. So that leads me to a question I often ask people. What is success? Success is not what you've done compared to what others have done. Success is what you've done compared to what you knew you could have done or you should have done. So success has more to do with fulfilling your assignment and your purpose than it has to do with beating someone else in a race. It's important for you to understand that success is very personal. Your success has nothing to do with other people. It has everything to do with you and what you do. So success in life is discovering two things. Number one, your purpose. And number two, your assignment. 
Success, therefore, is fulfillment and completion of your purpose. Can you write that down, please? I just gave you the this, this secret definition of success. What is success? It is fulfilling and completing your purpose in life. Purpose is the reason why a thing was created. A trumpet is successful when it blows a note. So a trumpet on display in your home is not successful. It's beautiful. It's a nice place to put it, but it's a failure. Why? Because the purpose for trumpet is to blow a note, not for display. A piano sitting in your house unplayed has made that piano unsuccessful. Even though it's beautiful, and it makes your home look distinguished, that piano is a failure. Why? Because it was created to produce music, not to take up space in your living room. So purpose determines success. Dressing up in expensive clothes is simply a well-dressed failure if that person is not doing what they were created to do. If you didn't do what you were born to do and you dressed up, you are a well-dressed disgrace to the manufacturer. Life is not about how well you dress or how expensive your shoe is. What's important in life is are you doing what you were born to do? And this is why most people are failing in life. They have not captured yet what they were born to do. Do you know why there's so much crime in your city? Man is ignorant of purpose. When a man doesn't understand his purpose in life, he withdraws from the world. Or worse, he participates in criminal activity. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus talked about when you live in a kingdom... Your success is related to some keys. He calls them secrets. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. Those secrets are called keys. Matthew 16, verse 19, he says, I will give you what? The keys, plural, of the kingdom. There are no keys to the kingdom. There are keys of the kingdom. Why is this important? He said because these keys open up heaven or close heaven. They open up life or close life. In other words, keys are determining whether you live in a lockup life or an open life, whether you succeed or fail. What are keys? Keys are laws, principles, or precepts. They are systems that you use. When you go to a locked door with a key, you are taking a law that makes the door submit, and it opens the door. That's what Christ meant when he used the word keys. Keys give you access. Keys are systems or laws by which everything functions. Keys are principles or laws. Now, here are some things you need to know about principles or laws that you need to remember. Write these down, please. Number one, principles and laws are universal. That is important because that means you don't need to change your country to be successful. A lot of people think that if I just make it to a certain country, I'll make it in life. There are countries where people have left their homes and today they are sweeping the street as a foreigner in that country. And they have a lower job in that country than they did in their former country. And some of those people have had to go back to their countries because they thought 
going to another country determine their success. If you live in Central America, for example, like Honduras, Guatemala, or El Salvador, most of you believe that if you were to leave your country and come to the United States, you'll make it. Believe me, it's not a matter of where you are located. The real issue is, do you know the laws of success? Location doesn't guarantee success because changing location doesn't change a person's mentality. Number two, principles and laws are permanent. Laws do not change. That means they are the same for Moses as they are for you today. Thirdly, principles and laws work everywhere and anywhere, anytime. They work in the midst of a crisis and they work where there is no crisis. Number four, principles and laws are not partial. That means laws don't work for a certain race of people and then don't work for other race of people. Laws work for all people. Laws don't work for tall people or short people or fat people or skinny people or cute people or black people or white people. Laws work for people if people work the laws. Number five, principles and laws guarantee success. The only way you can guarantee something is if you follow instructions. And this is why success is predictable. You can guarantee results if you follow the laws. If you are failing in your life, Try and study what laws you are violating. If you are succeeding in life, study the laws you are obeying. There's no mystery to life. Most of us are hoping to succeed in life and don't understand the laws that are established by God to succeed. Number six, principles and laws can never be broken. Why? You cannot broke a law. The law breaks you if you choose to violate it. Don't think you can violate a law and then try to be successful. It's like running a red light, hoping you don't get into an accident. If you don't obey the law, the law break you. So if you want to be successful, don't try to take shortcuts. Don't try to find your way of doing things. If you don't have the money to buy something, stealing is a shortcut. You know, it's amazing that people who steal would rather walk around all day having a conversation with their sin conscious, their guilt, and risk getting put in jail than to work and save money to buy the things they want to have. There are laws established in life by the Creator that everyone has to follow. Anyone who does not follow those laws has the same results. Same goes for anyone who follows those laws has the same results. Number seven, principles and laws are inherent and their judgment is inherent. That means you don't need to be punished if you violate a law. The punishment is in the law. The principle of fire is heat. If you put your hand in fire, no one has to burn you. You violate a law, you get burned. And so it is with everything in life. God doesn't really judge us. The laws he built into life judges us. You have sex? You get pregnant? Who do you blame? You violated a law of fidelity or the law of self-control and now the judgment is built in and you conceived a baby. And now you want to create another law by violating that baby by committing adultery. 
And now you're kicking a judgment of guilt for the rest of your life. Because that child might have been like Vanessa Treviso. Now you sit around with this guilt. Because you violated law after law after law. The way you fix that is you decide, I will never violate another law again. That leads to principle number eight. Principles and laws protect the product. When you obey the laws laid down by the manufacturer, you don't need to worry about protection. They protect you. Do not fornicate. You can never be pregnant if you don't ever fornicate. It protects you. Keep the law and you never have to worry. I wonder if I'm pregnant. I wonder if I'm pregnant. Well... If you had sex, you better wonder all night. But if you never have sex, you can never be pregnant. The protection comes in obedience to the law. When you stop at a red light, you don't have to worry about getting arrested. The protection is in the law. Guilt comes when you break the law. Because you are no longer protected by that law. So it is in life with success. People want to know, does God want you to be successful and prosperous? Well, I want to show you a verse of scripture that deals with God's economic plan or God's plan for your prosperity. Deuteronomy 8, 17 says, You may say to yourself, God says, My power and the strength of my hand has produced this wealth for me. But you must remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gave you the ability to produce wealth, to confirm his covenant that he made to your fathers. Look, God is not against you becoming wealthy, but he wants you to remember where it came from. Secondly, this verse tells us how to become wealthy. And wealth in this verse does not come from God in the sense that God gives you money. We have to read it carefully. What does God give you? The ability to produce. Wealth comes from finding your ability to produce something. Write that down. The word ability here actually means ideas. We talked about this in an earlier session, leadership and wealth. You can find it on my YouTube channel if you missed it. So God has given you the ability to produce. To produce means, write this down please, to work something out or to express something. The first command God gave man was to work. Work shows up in the Bible before woman. That's because a man needs work before woman. Man was already working in the garden before he met Eve. Work is a law. That means anything that stops you from working violates a law. So if you want to get something without effort, you are violating a law. If you want something free, you are violating a law. That's why God doesn't like beggars. A beggar is somebody who wants something without effort. Here's a quote by King David on this issue. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. Notice the condition. Righteous. What is righteous? Staying in line with the laws. He says, if you stay aligned with the laws, you will never be a beggar. Why? A beggar is not a worker. And the first law that God gave man was what? The first law God gave man was to work. 
let me prove it so you can understand this principle of work. So do this. Get your Bibles out and turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. And actually what I want to do is first, let's get the context. I want to get the pretext first. So we are going to read, let's start at verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. Underline that in your Bible, the word work. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. And the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now notice, God wouldn't allow growth until there is somebody working. Now let's read verse 15. The Lord God took the man that he had just created and he put man in the garden of Eden and he commanded the man to what to work and to care for it so underline to work in your bible work the master key work is not a curse the curse occurs in chapter 3 curse is not work. Work shows up in chapter 2 of Genesis. No devil, no sin, no demon, and God says, work. Why? Because work is the reason why you were created. Work is a gift. God has given you the gift of work. He designed you to work. And fulfillment of your earthly assignment requires that you work. Work provides the opportunities to fulfill purpose. Work is part of your design. If you're not working, you're not fulfilling your purpose. Most of the people who are burdens on society those who are on welfare or receive some other social services are not a part of the workforce. The food stamps, medical assistance, and the rent assistance they receive come from the pockets of those who work and pay taxes. Thus, everyone who asks the government to pay their bills is living out of your pocket if you are working. Those who live on welfare are deficits to the country. These people are a burden. In God's system, everyone needs to work. Work is a necessity of life. You cannot avoid work and expect to function. You need to work. Your ability to dominate and subdue the earth is related to the effort you put forth to accomplish the tasks God gives you. If you refuse to work, your potential to express God's image and to bear fruit are sealed inside you, dormant and useless. Without labor, there is no fruit, and the blessings God wants to give you are forfeited. Your refusal to work destroys the possibilities you possess to cooperate with God's work of creation. So let me explain what God means by work. The word work, write it down please, in Greek and Hebrew is the word ergon. And that's spelled E-R-G-O-N, ergon. The word actually means to become. The word work also means to work out something, to become what you are. So when God told Adam, work, he was telling Adam to become what's trapped on the inside. 
So work is not something that the government provides. You're looking for jobs, and that's why you're broke. You're waiting for some investor to come and give you a job. Work has nothing to do with you finding a job. Remember, work has to do with finding who you are supposed to become. That's the true meaning of work. I am successful, not because I'm doing something. I am successful because I'm becoming something. Work is like a seed becoming a tree. Work is becoming what you were designed to be and do. Work is like a bird flying. A bird was designed to fly. That's his work. So when a bird is flying, you can actually say the bird is working. When a fish is swimming, you can say the fish is working. When a tree comes out of a seed, you can say the seed is working. Why? It's becoming what it is. Now, not all jobs are your work. Most people go to a place where they cannot become. Why? Because you are restricted by what the job tells you to do and what you cannot do. And this is why most people hate their jobs. Because their jobs actually suffocate their real gift. And so they find themselves hating Monday mornings, going to a place they don't like, and they can't wait to leave it because it's like a bird trapped in a cage for eight hours. And after a while, you go crazy and you want to quit. Why? Because you are not really working. You have a job. Your job, therefore, will never be your work because it traps you. Your work can become your job if you find your work in your job. In other words, if you have a job where you are becoming, then you are not on a job. You are going to work. It's like a singer who was born to sing, and he has a singing job. He's not going to a job. He's going to work. Let me say something very interesting. Listen to the words of Jesus. I work the work of him that sent me. And then he says, I do the work of him who sent me. My father works, therefore I work. And I came to work the work that the father gave me to do. He never says job. Jesus had a job, you know. His job was a carpenter. His work was redeemer. He said, I didn't come to be a carpenter. I came really to redeem the world. That's my work. And my work is to do what? The will of my father. That's an important statement. My work is what? The will. What is will? The original intent of the manufacturer who sent me. So work is becoming what you were born to be. And work, therefore, can become your job. If you are doing in your job what you were given life to do. Most jobs kill people. Jobs can kill you. Because you can actually be trapped in a place for 40 years, suffocating your life and living in bitterness and hatred and anger, and you are always irritated because you are in a place you don't want to be and you don't like to be, and therefore you hate everybody every day for 40 years. And the Bible says bitterness dries up the bones. That means it creates cancer. Ever hear people say, this job is killing me. They are correct. But you know what? A bird trapped in a cage 
hasn't lost the capacity to fly. It stopped flying, but it still has the ability to fly if it were set free. So I've come to tell you in this session how to be free from your job so you can find your work. Because your prosperity is not in your job. Your prosperity is in your work. Your goal in life is not to be employed. Write that down. And then you know what? Just look at it. Now say that out loud. My goal in life is not to be employed. The number one promise of your governments is jobs. So your goal is to get a job. The young man here tonight comes out of high school and the first thing he is told, go get a job. They never say, go get a business. The guy who has just come out of college has a PhD or master's degree, comes back home, and his first attempt, I have to find a job. It's as if we believe we were born to be employed. But I want to change your thinking tonight. So I have a word for you. This is a new word for most of you. Please write this down. You were born to be deployed. Say that out loud. My goal is to be deployed. Come on, say it. My goal is to be deployed. Employment means somebody else controls you. Deployment means you release what's on the inside of you. Those who deploy themselves employ others. Deployers employ. What did I just say? Deployers employ. If you are tired of being employed, focus on being a deployer. That's where your wealth is. Those who deploy themselves determine their own value. I kind of, I'm giving you a little bit of a breakdown here between deployment and employment. So please write this list down. Those who deploy themselves determine their own value. Those who are employed, their value is determined by the one who employed them. So a salary is really someone else's opinion of how much you are worth. When you deploy yourself, you establish your own worth. So a job is employment. Work is deployment. Employment prepares you for deployment. When you go to get a job, always remember, this is temporary. I'm going to use this opportunity to deploy myself. In other words, deployment activates your gifts and energizes your life, not employment. Have you ever noticed that people who are employed are always complaining? This stupid job. I'm tired of being here. I'm not getting paid enough to do this. These folks don't trust me. They don't know what I'm worth. They don't understand me. I hate this place. How come I haven't gotten a raise? Why haven't I gotten promoted? They just don't appreciate me. And they spend years just employed and complaining while they are employed. And the complaining is coming from the fact that their gift is not being activated. Therefore, there is no excitement and no energy in their lives. When you can go to a place where you can release all your desires and the gifts on the inside, you can't wait to get there. That's why people who live long are usually those who have found something that they can't wait to do in the morning. Because it's good for your health. Your adrenaline goes higher and higher and your systems that fend off disease are working because your immune system finds strength from a good attitude. It protects you from getting sick. Remember, a job can kill you. But your work 
That's what keeps you healthy, physically and emotionally. Here's something to think about. Birds don't get tired flying. Do you know that scientists have discovered that when birds fly, they get energy from flight? And fish get energy from swimming? That means if what you are doing is wearing you out, then that's a sign that you are not in your work. A person who is in their gift hates sunsets. Why? Because a deployee wants the day to be longer. They can't wait to stay in what they're doing. But if you can't wait for five o'clock, you watch your clock from three o'clock until five. Listen, that means you are not in your work yet. You are on a job. You are employed and not deployed. You are an employee and not a deployee. Deployment is the use and the serving of your natural gift to the world. Now they asked Michael Jackson, why do you love singing so much? He said, because singing is me. It is me. That's true, remember? What is work? Work is becoming what you are. He calls it going to work. Singing is not a job to a real singer. So when you find your gift, when you find your deployment, you actually find the gift you were born to serve to the world, and the world will pay you for being yourself. Imagine getting paid to do something you actually like to do. Your destiny is not a job. Getting and keeping a job all your life, then retire, is not God's will for you. You know, you can actually be lazy and still have a job. But to work, to become, you cannot be lazy-minded. Most people are depressed when they get fired because they didn't think beyond their jobs. Therefore, you cannot put your hope in a job. The company you work for, the minute you hit 65, they already start singing the hymns. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Why? You 65, they already buried you. They see the young guy coming out of college who actually wants to work for less. The older you are, the more expensive you are to the company. So wake up and think beyond your job. That means the solution to your future success is not in the job you have. It's in what you're thinking beyond the job. You got laid off or they only got you on two days a week and you realize that your future has been attacked by the fact that they laid you off. So you have to cut back on your standard of living. Maybe lose a car, lose your house. Why? Because you thought your future is in your job. The future is in the one who holds the job. Don't ever allow an organization to be your hope. Every job is temporary. No matter how much they praise you and love you, you better think beyond that position because they will tell you bye-bye. You know, you should read the book of Daniel sometime. I actually, I just read that myself uh, just this week. And Daniel made himself so valuable. The king said he was an excellent worker and no one wanted to get rid of Daniel. There are some people who can't wait till you leave. Why? Because you are a nuisance. You are not an asset. You are a deficit to the company. There are supervisors praying for you to resign. When there's a downsizing taking place in the economy, the first one to be let go is the one who caused all the problems. 
They are happy for crisis. Why? Finally, they can get rid of you legally and give a reason for it. Because you made yourself a nuisance. Ah, but if you make yourself indispensable by serving your gift with quality and becoming more and more valuable by solving problems for people, they won't let you go. The key to becoming prosperous is solving problems. Write that down, please. You are kept for the problems you solved. You are let go for the problems you create. If you are not solving problems, you become a problem. Someone asked me today, how you doing? I say, I'm a solution, not a problem. I mean that. And you were born to solve a problem in your generation. That's your real work. You will have plenty of work to do the rest of your life once you understand the problem you were born to solve. Find problems that you can solve and then solve them. Don't look for a job. Look for a problem. People are looking for money. Don't look for money. Look for a problem. You solve problems, you get paid. That's the difference between your job and your work. I want to give you this list. Never confuse your job with your work. They are different. Your job is what they train you to do. Your work is what you are gifted to do. Your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. Your job is your career. Your work is your life assignment. Your job is your skill. Your work is your gift. They can fire you because they don't need your skill, but they can never fire your gift. It goes with you. And the Bible says a man's gift makes room for him in the world. Our problem is our cultures have not trained us to find our gift. They train us to find a job. So they tell you, go get a skill. Remember those words? The problem is your skill is dispensable. So if you've been using your skill for 20 years and now you're making $30,000 a year and when a young guy who came out of college with a more refined skill in your area, he only wants 25, you're gone. In other words, skills are dispensable. Ah, but gifts can never be taken away. You can retire from your job, but you can never retire from your work. I've never seen a bird that says, I'm tired flying. I retired. I don't want to fly no more. I've never seen a fish who says, I'm tired swimming. I retired. I don't swim no more. I've never seen a seed that says, I'm retired from bringing forth a tree. In other words, you can never retire from your gift. You can retire from your skill. You're skilled for secretary, but they don't want secretaries. So now what are you gonna do? Your skill has become your curse. People don't want your skill. What they really want is your gift. That's what they're looking for. But they don't know what you've got because you don't know what you have or how to serve it to the world. You're still stuck in a job with an employee's mentality. Think beyond your job. Your future is in your seed gift. It's not in your job. It's in the gift that you have.